Dr. Kaplan, welcome to Race Cogitons. It's good to have you here. Thanks, Adam. It's good to be here. Thank you. So Dr. Kaplan is a cognitive neuroscientist and a research professor at the University of Southern California, where he studies conceptions of self, empathy and emotion, belief, um, social belief. Uh, anything you'd like to add? I mean, I guess we'll get into into that, but yeah, it's it's always hard to characterize what it is that I study because uh, I have I have touched on a lot of different things, but I think you've got the the general gist there. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, we'll we'll get more into it later, but I want to start from the very beginning. So, when did you first know you wanted to become a scientist? If you knew that, not even neuroscience, but just science. Were you were you like one of the kids who was going around inspecting bugs or <laughs> watching documentaries instead of cartoons? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. I don't know if I, th if I was, if I thought, if there, if I can point to a time, a moment in which I decided I wanted to be a scientist per se, mm. but I do think I was always curious about the natural world. Um, and I did have a lot of experiences with, with nature growing up. You know, I, I grew up in, in Connecticut in the suburbs of, of New York city. It's very like woodsy area. And we had these like dense woods behind my house. And I used to just spend like all day back there, just like, you know, making little trails through the woods and hanging out on the rocks and, you know, picking up the rocks and looking at the mm -hmm. colonies of insects slithering underneath them. And so I did always have a sort of observational orientation towards the world. And I guess one of the things that was always uh, most interesting to me was consciousness itself. I mean, just the, the fact of, of having a conscious mind um, just seems like th the weirdest thing in in the universe uh -huh. um, and so that 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 to me was always sort of the, the big question is like why are we conscious and how is it possible that a p piece of meat in our heads could could be conscious yeah that's a huge question for me nowadays I, I definitely didn't start thinking about it really probably not until college what about you was it was it always an early curiosity yeah no i, I it's hard to it's hard to pinpoint i know that there you know there's one experience that i can um recall that it had a big effect on me. And I think I was a freshman in college. Um, I think it was basically Christmas break of my freshman year in college. I went back home to Connecticut and I had this experience with uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And it was a really profound experience as they tend to be. Um, and, you know, I had all of the, all the classic stuff, dissolution of self, and it was quite scary um, and uncomfortable. Uh, but you know, all of my basic perceptions changed. And it was kind of like, you know, the old saying that a fish doesn't realize it's in, in the water. And all the different um, things that I had been taking for granted in my own conscious experience, the fact that they were changed by this chemical um, made me aware that they were there, my perception of time, my perception of myself. And the fact that all of these changes happened because of some uh, molecule interacting with my brain really drove home for me in a very visceral way the the uh, the physicality of consciousness you know the, the 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 dependence of my own experience upon the biochemical interactions uh, happening in within my brain yeah that's very interesting so you you were already in college at that point were you already studying neuroscience or did did this kind of change your whole future I think I didn't know. I wasn't studying neuroscience. I was just taking a lot of different classes to find out what I was interested in. Um, I did take a lot of psychology classes, but I also took a lot. Of, I, was, I was really, for a while, I think I thought it was, would be into linguistics. I remember taking all these really advanced linguistics uh, classes because the, you know, the whole concept of, of language and, and how we use it is really interesting. I mean, I guess that is part of cognitive science. Um, but uh, yeah, I started to take more and more psychology courses and at uh, University of Michigan, where, where I was an undergrad, um, they had this major where you could get a, a Bachelor of Science degree in psychology. So it's called a, um, psychology as a natural science. And um, that, that ended up being my major. And so um, I took a lot more classes and just the, the more I got into it, I worked in a, in a neuroscience lab. I was an undergrad doing some EEG stuff with uh, Bill Gehring. Uh, and he was studying um, this interesting phenomenon called the error-related negativity, where um, when 
people make mistakes in various cognitive tasks. There's a little electrical signal that happens that you can record with, with EEG. It probably comes from the anterior cingulate cortex. And it's a form of self-awareness because like if you sort of notice, in, in order to know that you made a mistake, you have to be monitoring what you're doing. And so it was a, um, I liked working in that lab because that sort of metacognitive aspect tied in with my interest in, in consciousness. And so sort of the more I did this stuff, the more I was like, I don't really want to stop doing it. I, what's, the, you know, what's the way to continue uh, studying this stuff and going to grad school in psychology seemed to be the way to do that. I don't know if I had a plan, like I'm going to be a scientist or I'm going to do X. I just, that just seemed like the way to continue um, learning about these, these things that I found most interesting. Yeah, I feel the same way. So did you join the lab before or after this, this trip you had? Was that what motivated you to, to go into the um, that, that trip was my freshman year and I probably joined the lab in my, my junior year. So there was some, some progression there, but man, I'm, I'm old enough that I can't, uh, can't draw the dots too carefully at this point. Um, okay. Yeah, so that, that makes sense. So you had this uh, very life-changing experience early in college and you began taking psychology courses and working in a neuro lab. So then comes graduate school. Yeah. Uh, so was graduate school like were you very set on it by the end of college or was it just kind of uh, you wa you wanted to just keep learning? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to keep keep learning. And uh, I, I did have the sense that maybe it wasn't the most practical thing to do because like, you know, what 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 kind of a career are you going to have from just, you know, s studying this this sort of thing? It seems it, back then it seemed like maybe impractical. Now it's even more difficult because um, academic jobs are just, you know, fewer and fewer compared to the number of people that get PhDs. But so it wasn't a practical decision. I was just following my curiosity. And when I was looking around uh, to go to grad school, I really wanted to find a mentor who sort of shared my interest in consciousness. Because mm -hmm. for me, doing psychology and, and doing neuroscience was always a way to answer philosophical questions. And uh, my, my sort of core interest seemed to be in, in philosophy of mind, really. And and uh, seemed like cognitive neuroscience was sort of the new way of of doing philosophy of mind, and I wanted to find somebody who um, resonated with that um, um, interest, with that intention, and so I found um, this man named Iran Zidel at UCLA, and Iran Zidel was really interesting to me because he had worked; uh, he was a student of Roger Sperry. And uh, Roger Sperry won the Nobel Prize um, for his work on the split brain. And so um, Iran had worked with some of the original split brain patients. And that those, these are people that have had their brains that left and right hemispheres surgically separated as a treatment for epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the first big neuroscience cases that really impacted philosophy of mind. Because um, these people seemed like they had, in many respects, two independent selves within their heads. You know, there's information that the left hemisphere had that it wasn't shared with the right hemisphere, but they seemed to be able to um, respond in, in various specific ways that let you know that there was there were consciousnesses in there. Um, and so it, this split brain case was um, an example of, of, of doing that kind of philosophy of mind with, with neuroscience. And that's what, what drew me to Aran Zidel in addition to the fact that he just seemed to be a really nice guy. And, and for our initial conversations we had um, were exactly the kind of stuff that I wanted to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. So your your mentor was also working with split brain patients or was that just he his mentor was? Yeah, I mean, that's how he started his career. And you know, the actual split brain patients that they had worked with early on that had their uh, surgeries in the 50s and, and 60s were getting older by the time I joined the lab. And um, they were still around. And so we, we saw the split brain patients every once in a while. And I, I got to um, meet a couple of them and, and do some experiments with them. Um, but a lot of the work had transitioned to um, being able to test questions about hemispheric specialization using normal, healthy adults. So there are things you can do, for example, if you flash stimuli to one visual field or the other and ask people to respond with their left and right hands, there are various things that you can reason out about how the two hemispheres are behaving and how they're working different cognitively. And that was most of the work that, that the lab did when I joined it. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it was, it was a lot more towards traditional cognitive neuroscience in the sense of like perception and reaction time and all that stuff. Yeah. As opposed to this more abstract 
uh, thinking with, with philosophy of mind and, and with your work now that, that we'll get to later, but was, was that underlying philosophy still there from the start in the back of your mind, motivating all this? Yeah, it was. And the thing is, you know, it's, it's a, it's a difficult thing to translate into practical science. And so um, we tend to, uh, in neuroscience, when you're interested in something like consciousness, your, your work tends to kind of dance around the issue and, and deal with these kind of peripheral things that are, that are more low hanging fruit than the real, really, really difficult problems that you can only nip at once in a while. So studying what, what I was doing in my uh, dissertation in, in that lab was studying um, how the two different hemispheres differed in, in their um, metacognitive abilities. And it was kind of a, in a way, an outgrowth of the the work that I had been doing as an undergraduate in Bill Gehring's lab. And I looked at uh, how the two hemispheres process feedback about their performance differently from one another. Um, so if you're doing some kind of a cognitive task and um, let's say I tell you, you you're doing well or that you got, got some answer correct or that you got it incorrect, um, how do the two hemispheres respond differently to that kind of information? And we found that if you present feedback to one hemisphere or the other, it actually made a difference where, where it went first. And so we were doing all kinds of behavioral experiments to parse out what that was. I've heard a theory tying the uh, brain lateralization with, with like the Eastern ideas of chaos and order. So the right brain being more abstract and creative, being attuned to chaos, and then left brain all organized, being attuned to order. Do you think there's any merit to that? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of those kinds of characterizations. And there are a, a lot of them. I mean, the, the hemispheric specialization thing is a, is a really interesting uh, just sociology of science story about how the whole um, idea of the difference between the left and the right hemispheres was exported into the popular culture. And um, there are so many sort of exaggerated cartoonish versions. I'm not saying that's what <laughs> the one you described is, but there are, there are a lot of these different things. Um, and, and most of them uh, don't have a lot of support in the, in the data. I mean, I, I, I think that the kind of thing you're describing might be useful as a, as a metaphor, um, but it, it's probably very coarsely associated with the actual function of, of the two hemispheres. I mean, look, for the most part, what the left and right hemispheres do is very similar. Um, they're, they're different in certain ways, but the differences tend to be relative differences and not um, complete differences, like one hemisphere does X and the other hemisphere does Y. With the exception of maybe speech, the left hemisphere is, is generally specialized for speech. But for most of these cognitive tasks you see are, are little tweaks, little biases where maybe the left hemisphere um, is, is uh, better at fine details and the right hemisphere is, is better at seeing global um, gestalts, but the differences are, are smaller than, than we might imagine. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I also, I also remember reading that there's differences in left-handed and right-handed individuals. So I guess it's it's something like your whatever motor specialization you need for handedness. If it's normally on one side of the brain in left-handed people, it's gonna be on the opposite side. Is that right? Yeah, sort of. It's true that there are associations there. So for most of us, speech is lateralized on the left side of the brain. That includes right-handers and left-handers. So most left-handers still have speech lateralized on the left, but a portion of left-handers, about, um, about a third of them, uh, have uh, either bilateral speech or if complete flip. The, the complete flip where it's on the right side is relatively rare, but you see a lot more variability in, in speech lateralization in left-handers. Mm -hmm. sure. Are, are you uh, right-handed or left-handed? I'm a righty. I'm nice. A righty. I'm, I'm in the right-handed club as well. Yeah. <laughs> statistically speaking there there we go that's as expected uh <laughs> so when it's flipped uh like you were mentioning in, in some left-handed individuals are there any behavioral differences or is it just like a structural thing and, and everything works just fine yeah i don't th i don't think so i mean that's not that's not my specialty so it's possible there's some uh you know new um details on that that i, I haven't followed but no i, I think it's pretty much the same Okay. And, split. Yeah. and you know, you can, you can even, um, if there are cases where people are missing their left hemisphere completely. So it's a case of, of um, hemispherectomy where one hemisphere is, is either completely removed or disconnected um, in childhood um, as a uh, treatment for some sort of severe diseases. Um, and if that's done early enough, the right hemisphere picks up language pretty well and and you don't really see too much of a deficit if any 
So it's pretty malleable. Right. So when you were doing this dissertation work, did you have mostly adults or were you also picking up on some of those developmental changes? Uh, I personally only worked with adults, but we did have people in the lab that worked with conditions like um, colossal agenesis where the corpus callosum failed to develop and with, with hemispherectomies. But I, I, that wasn't the work that I touched myself. Um, when I was doing adults and, and towards the end of my, my career, I started to collaborate, not my career, my, my, um, my graduate study. I started to collaborate. Um, I would, this is around uh, this is the turn of the century now. And uh, neuroimaging was really becoming more and more um, all the rage in, in cognitive neuroscience. You know, when I was an undergraduate student, uh, functional MRI was like this thing that people heard of, but maybe were skeptical of and didn't seem possible. It seemed like magic, mm -hmm. but it was becoming more and more doable uh, as I was in, in graduate school. And I, I realized I really wanted to do it. I mean, just something about it just seemed so cool to me that you could measure what's happening inside a living human brain while people are doing things. So I uh, hooked up with um, this uh, professor named Marco Iacoboni, who is in the Brain Mapping Center at UCLA, so that I could learn uh, neuroimaging. And I had one experiment in my, in my dissertation that was a, a neuroimaging experiment on the same idea of, of lateralized feedback. But that was this very uh, first neuroimaging experiment I ever did and kind of wet my appetite for doing that. And I decided after, after that, that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Is there a modern day equivalent of like, you know, this new upcoming technology that that maybe some people have only heard of, but it's it's not nearly as widely available yet? Uh, it's, it's hard to know in advance. Otherwise, I would buy stock in whatever that product was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, there's like one thing that that, that is around more is a near infrared spectros spectroscopy using um, uh, light uh, refraction to uh, measure uh, brain activity. Um, and, uh, that more and more people are, are doing that now. So maybe that's the next thing. Okay. So when, what was the rough, uh, timeline for how, how MRI scanning and other neuroimaging techniques became more common? You said they were just, they were just coming into, into practice like around yeah. the early two thousands. Well, it's like the timeline is that, um, MRI was invented like in the seventies basically. And in the, in the eighties and nineties, it started to become more um, available for clinical uses in, in hospitals, but that's really structural MRI. And just looking at the structures of the brain, just like you would get an X-ray of your, your leg or something. You just want to see what the parts are on the inside. And that's really useful for, for a lot of clinical purposes. You want to know there's a tumor in there, for example. Um, so in the 1980s, all, all the functional brain imaging was really done with PET, with positron emission tomography. And the deal with PET is that you ingest a radioactive tracer and then you watch which regions of the brain take up that tracer. And you could do things like, you know, uh, labeling uh, glucose, for example. So you can see where glucose metabolism is. When neurons are doing a lot of stuff, they uh, will then show up brighter on the, on the PET scan. Um, the downside, there's a lot of downsides to PET scan. One is that like, you know, Sticking radioactivity in people is generally uh, frowned upon. <laughs> not not great if you can avoid it. Um, also, it's kind of it doesn't give you great temporal resolution because of the um, decay time, and you're sort of aggregating across large periods of time, so you can't really see things that are changing changing quickly. Um, so in the in the early '90s is when people first realized that you could use uh, MRI to try to see brain function, and it relied on this discovery that. Um, the deoxygenated form of hemoglobin, the molecule in the blood that carries oxygen, when it has the oxygen molecule compared when it doesn't have the oxygen molecule, it shows up differently on M MRI scan, certain MRI scans that are tuned in a, in a particular way. It's a very subtle effect. And then over the course of the next decade, people worked out the technology to be able to exploit that um, factor, um, what we call blood oxygen level dependent signal, bold signal to be able to measure uh, brain activity. And so that was happening throughout the 90s and cognitive neuroscientists were following that and were certainly interested in it. Um, and um, some of the first fMRI studies were, were in, the, in the mid 90s. Um, but, uh, you know, the technology was, was not user-friendly at the time. When, when I did um, my first MRI scans in the late 90s, and the equipment was so different. Nowadays, it's like a, like an iPhone. You know, you just push a button and it, it does what it what it needs to do. 
Back then, you had to have like a separate computer to do your shimming and read off the numbers and then type in the numbers from this machine into that machine. It was much more like, you know, um, mechanical. So, so they've become smaller and cheaper, I guess. I've heard, I've heard with physicists where, especially when they have like these big fancy space telescopes, they have to fight over the hours of, you know, when, when you get to use it. Is it the same way with MRI machines or is it pretty like every lab can have their own now? Well, they're very expensive. I mean, it, it was for a while unlike that because um, the only places that had them be, were, were hospitals uh, and scientists wanting to use them had to compete with all the clinical uses. And of course, if, if someone needs it for clinical use, that takes precedence over us um, doing our tinkering around and mm -hmm. trying to find out what's happening in the brain uh, for science. So, uh, but nowadays there are a lot more research dedicated MRI scanners, like the one that uh, we have. Uh, I'm uh, the co-director of the Dornsife Neuroimaging Center. And so I helped to run the center at, at USC where we have our own research dedicated scanner. And that's that's more common now at major universities, but you're talking about an investment of several million dollars to get that set up. So it's not like every lab has one. They're generally uh, shared uh, lab spaces. So the one we have is shared by basically, you know, anyone on the USC main campus who wants to do this kind of research. Mm -hmm. And do you think it's comparable to computers in, in let's say, the, the 60s, maybe, where they're big and expensive, but in 50 years from now, you think they'll be much cheaper and, and you know, maybe portable? I don't think so. I mean, there are some physical constraints there that don't come into play with, with computers. You have um, the, the physics of the magnetic fields. You know, in, in order to make this work, you need an incredibly strong magnetic field. You can... Um, the magnetic field we have in our magnet is three Tesla. You know, it's just the kind of thing you could pull a car across the room. And so it's this big coil of wires and that coil is um, cooled to basically absolute zero so that there's no friction in the wires and the current can and run fast enough to produce that kind of, that strength of magnetic field. Um, so that's big and there are other clunky parts to it that sort of have to be the size they are. Also, you want the, at least the head to fit into it, um, if not the body. Um, so I don't know. I mean, there are some experiments with low field fMRI um, that you can actually squeeze more juice out of that with, with new technologies. But I, I don't think it's going to be the kind of thing that, that uh, we all have on our desktop. Yeah, like that all makes sense, but I, I never considered that before. So, yeah. All right. So when did you graduate uh, with, your, with your PhD? Uh, 2001. Okay, so 2001, and, and you sent me an interesting paper from 2010, and we'll get to that. But what happens in that near a decade in between? Uh, it's the it's the lost the lost years of the Kaplan saga. You know, I, I, it, uh, a lot of things happened. First of all, um, I went to really I did a postdoc a postdoctoral fellowship at at UCLA at the Brain Mapping Center. Oh, hold on a second. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Some, some uh, crazy screeching puppy in the background. Um, where was I? So I did a postdoctoral fellowship with uh, Marco Iacoboni at the Brain Mapping Center at UCLA. And that really allowed me to uh, delve into uh, learning how to do MRI. And actually, the first year of my postdoc, which I had really intended to like, you know, dig into MRI and really become good at the methods, um, the Brain Mapping Center decided to upgrade their MRI scanner, which involved taking the current one down for almost a year. Um, and I, But the happy opportunity that came with that is that I was allowed to, to uh, learn a different technology that Marco had in his lab, which was TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So with TMS, you're, it's basically a brain stimulation technology. You have a magnet, you put it up against the head, it runs a, a current, sorry, it's not a magnet, it's a coil. Uh, you run a current through this coil and uh, induces a current in the brain underneath. And you can use that to stimulate the brain, to disrupt activity. Um, and so I uh, learned how to do TMS. Um, it's nice that I got, I feel good that I got a taste of all these different technologies. When I was an undergrad, I, I did some EEG work. I did this TMS with Marco. And then after, uh, after the year was up, I, I learned MRI and, and got pretty good at it. And it really clicked with me because um, one of the things that I've always loved technology um, and, uh, you know, speaking of having a computer on, on every desk, I was really into computers pretty early on when, when they weren't as much of a thing. I 
I had my Commodore 64 when I was nine years old and um, I was learning to program in basic. I actually went to this incredibly nerdy computer camp. Um, nowadays, it seems like that would be like a cool thing to do, but um, trust me, it was not at the time. Um, and we learned all the early programming languages like Pascal. Um, and so the, the MRI was, it was really um, fun for me because there is a lot of technology and computer and programming and analysis um, that's, in, that's involved in, in doing the actual work. And so it kind of uh, combined two of my favorite things. And uh, that's basically been my main uh, tool ever, ever since. Right. So um, in, in, in Marco's lab, what we were studying was uh, he, he had been studying um, mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are these uh, neurons that uh, are in the, discovered in the, in the motor cortex of the monkey, the part of the brain that controls movements. And uh, this is some Italian researchers discovered that some of these neurons in a particular area in the frontal lobe of the monkey that controls movements also responded when the monkey saw somebody else making the same movement. And that's why they're called mirror neurons. And these uh, uh, seem to be uh, important for things like empathy, you know, understanding what other people are doing, feeling what they're feeling. Um, and this connection, this resonance that we have with, with other people. And that was the aspect of it that, that really interested me. Um, and so uh, I worked with Marco doing some fMRI and, and TMS studies that, that were related to this uh, idea of, of empathy and how it works in the brain. That sounds very cool. It, it reminds me of this uh, one study done by um, Rebecca Saxe at MIT, and she used TMS on like a moral decision uh, making task. So it was something like, what's worse, you you poison someone with co with by you you accidentally poison someone's coffee versus you attempt to poison someone, but it turns out your poison was sugar and they survive. And most people said that attempted murder was worse than like accidental manslaughter. Uh, but with the TMS on their moral decision-making area, then they, uh, they the, the results were flipped. Yeah, that's really interesting that you can change uh, moral decision-making with TMS. It's actually um, um, scientist who's a postdoc in my lab right now, Leonardo Christoph Moore has done a very similar experiment to that where they, they um, measure people's behavior in a generosity task. Um, how much money would, would you give to, to other people? Um, and, and they were able to manipulate how generous people were by applying TMS to the, to the frontal lobe as well. So it's kind of interesting that you can turn these psychological knobs and uh, that, that's really what makes, what makes TMS cool as a, as a tool is that you, you really learn about the causal relationship of the brain region that you're manipulating and the psychological task. So when we do fMRI, we see these basically, all of what we do is more or less correlational. You know, we're, we're seeing the correlations between the brain activity in region X and, and some thing that you're doing, let's say it's generosity, but we don't necessarily know that, that what that brain region is doing is necessary uh, for, for the task. It might just be uh, lighting up because it's uh, um, doing something epiphenomenal that's not, not um, affecting your behavior. But with TMS, you can really get at those causal relationships because you can knock out a particular region and see what, what it, what, how that actually changes your behavior. Right. So are you guys finding that if you inhibit your, your empathy, then generosity goes down or is it the opposite? You inhibit something else and it goes up. Like you inhibit the, the whole caring about how much is in your bank account. <laughs> um, interpreting what those brain regions are doing um, when you're manipulating them is, is, is very, very difficult. And I'm not going to uh, venture it a guess on that because uh, Leo would, would do a better justice than I would. Um, but uh, just the fact that you can change those things is, is pretty incredible to me. I mean, what we were looking at was um, really how the motor cortex of, of the brain responds when, when you watch people do things. And one of the experiments I did with Marco, we showed people videos of various actions that, that people were doing. And we measure the um, putative mirror neuron activity in, in the human brain, the, the um, activation of, of motor regions when you're watching somebody do these movements. And we found that that activation, that resonant activation correlated with how empathic a person you were. So the people who are more empathic showed more of this resonant mirror neuron activity when they're watching others to act. That's interesting. It's, it sounds like a pretty good segue into your 2010 paper too. So if I understood correctly, you basically showed participants videos with things that 
we're all familiar with sounds with like dogs barking or whatever, but the videos were muted and yet you still found uh, brain activity in their auditory cortex. Yeah, that's right. So here's the, here's the story, here's the backstory on how that, that study came about. Uh, in 2008, uh, I moved to, from UCLA to USC. And um, the main reason I did that is because Antonio Damasio, who is um, a very uh, famous neuroscientist, when I was an undergrad, one of the books I first read when I first started thinking about um, neuroscience was Descartes' Error, this book that, that he had written. And um, the way he wrote it, um, to me, uh, really resonated with me because there was a, a sort of humanity to it. Um, I had been reading a lot of authors like Oliver Sacks and Alexander uh, Luria, um, who also uh, tried to understand the brain from the perspective of how it gives us our humanity. And, uh, and Antonio Damasio had, had done that really well in his discussion of, of emotion and reason in Descartes' era. And so I always admired him. And, uh, you know, I was living in Los Angeles and I, I love Los Angeles. Um, I grew up on the East coast, but, uh, once, you know, once I was here for 10 years or so, I decided I wasn't going anywhere. So I was going to do what I, what I could to stay here. Um, and he came to UCLA from Iowa where he'd been most of his career and started this new Institute called the brain and creativity Institute. Um, so, um, this was just an amazing serendipity uh, that one of my scientific um, heroes was, was here in, in Los Angeles and had started this institute with this crazy name that sounded uh, right up my alley. So I, I wrote, to, wrote to him and, and we met and I ended up, um, he ended up hiring me to work at the Brain and Creativity Institute. And one of the other people that, it, that he, had, um, he had hired, it just started the institute in 2006, 2007. And one of the other scientists who was there was a guy named Casper Meyer. And Casper uh, is uh, from uh, Switzerland, and he uh, was an MD and was really interested in consciousness. And so he had come to LA to work with Antonio on, on consciousness, and he'd written a lot of, about mirror neurons and consciousness, and was a really interesting guy. And I had been doing neuroimaging. I was really interested in becoming really interested in this, these new uh, approaches to neuroimaging that use machine learning to uh, analyze patterns of activity instead of looking at each individual pixel or, or what we call voxel in an MRI image uh, separately, you look at the patterns of activity across a, a brain region to try to see how they differ from uh, condition to condition. And you try to work backwards from these brain activity patterns to the experience of the person. You know, Can, can we do brain reading, figure out um, what somebody's experiencing from their brain activity. If we can, it tells us there's information in that brain region about what they're experiencing. So it was a new way of, of uh, looking into brain imaging. And I gave a lab meeting about this approach. And Casper came to me after the lab meeting and said, you know what, this approach you're talking about, this M MVPA, this multivariate pattern analysis, would be perfect to answer this question that I've been thinking about. He had been thinking about uh, multi-sensory interactions in the brain. So we thought through, and it was, it was the perfect uh, tool to answer the question that Casper was thinking about. And the question goes like this. Now, the reason I tell that story is because I just think this, part of the reason I love this study is because it was just such a, such a great collaboration between the two of us, uh, where mm -hmm. uh, his interests and skills and my interests and skills just fit perfectly together. Um, and it came out with this, this product that uh, is one of my favorite studies that I've done. And uh, the question was, you know, it, if you see something, um, what happens in, in the rest of the brain? So we know a lot about what happens in visual cortex when, when you see something, but when we, when we see things, we experience other aspects of, of those things that we're looking at. So if I see a cow, um, yeah, I see the cow, but I also know a lot about a cow. I know what it smells like. I know what it feels like. I know what it sounds like. You have all this associated information and how does the brain organize all of that information? And, and Antonio Damasio had this theory back in the eighties about the, how the neural hierarchy is, is formed. And his basic insight there was that these, um, these hierarchies work in two directions where information converges from the bottom up. We put together all these pieces of information about um, the different sensory information we get to build a picture of what we're seeing um, and information flows sort of up a neural hierarchy but information also flows back down so if i activate the idea of a cow i, I also reactivate all of these sensory experiences that i have associated with the cow originally 
So the prediction, the question was, uh, this theory predicted that if you see a cow, you should be activating in all of your other sensory cortices, all of the patterns of activity that are associated with seeing, with smelling a cow, with, with uh, touching a cow. We decided to focus on uh, hearing. And so we played people a bunch of silent video clips where they would see a dog barking or a person playing the violin or a chainsaw revving. And when you see these silent videos, it's like you hear it, even though you don't hear it. You know, it's like in your mind's ear, you've got the experience of that chainsaw going on. Right. And it, according to our theory, that was associated with very specific patterns of activity in your actual auditory cortex, the part of the brain that normally processes sound. And this multivariate pattern analysis was the perfect way to test that because we could take activity from auditory cortex and we could ask our machine learning classifier to try to distinguish among the patterns that were produced by the different stimuli. And if it could do that, it means that these patterns are so specific that there's information about what it is that you're seeing in the auditory cortex. And that's what we found, that we could predict above chance in very early auditory cortex what people were seeing, even though this is a part of the brain that normally processes sound, you know, and there is no sound coming in. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So was it already known that the auditory cortex would light up in response to, let's say, silent videos? And it's just that you guys proved that not only can it do that, but it does it differently according to different stimuli? Yeah, that's exactly right. And this, the, the idea had been there that when we um, experience uh, auditory imagery or even visual imagery, you know, most of this research was originally on visual imagery, that when you imagine seeing something that you activate your visual cortex. Um, but um, we showed that this was a very specific effect, that it, it was content specific, that the patterns of activity there were really related to the individual stimulus you were experiencing. The other thing we were able to show is that the videos that produced more vivid imagination experiences were the ones that the classifier could distinguish most clearly. So what our machine learning classifier was picking up on these patterns of brain activity and auditory cortex weren't unrelated to people's experience. They were, they were directly related to people's conscious experience of, of those stimuli they were seeing. Yeah, that's great. So that, that sounds still very technical in terms of like, well, the machine learning algorithm, and then it's more, it's more cognitive in the sense that it's you picking up on perception and not something more abstract like empathy. And your next paper, the 2016 one about political belief is, is much more tied to this social neuroscience type work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So was that, mm -hmm. was that a big transition between 2010 and 2016? Or were you kind of working in parallel on this cognitive stuff and this, this social stuff? Yeah, I did have a lot of different parallel interests. And I, you know, my criteria for choosing which study I'm going to do next um, is really based on my curiosity. I, I try to let my curiosity lead me and, and you know, rather than determining in advance, okay, I'm going to study multi-sensory interaction, learn everything I can about that. It's more just like, does the question interest me? And if the question does interest me and, and I'm curious about it and I really am excited about the idea, then I, then I go with it. And then in retrospect, I can look back and see what ties all these things together. And there usually is something, but these were independent threads at the time. Um, I had, when I was at UCLA, um, I crossed paths with uh, Sam Harris, who was getting his PhD at the time um, in Mark Cohen's lab at the Brain Mapping Center. And in his dissertation work, he was studying belief. And he and I collaborated on a study of religious belief, where we studied um, what's happening when people believe things, or when people accept the premise is true versus false. Um, and do religious people do that differently than non-religious people? And is there something different about the way people believe in Jesus as, as a real person versus believing in, um, you know, whether or not Santa Claus was real? Yeah. Um, so we, we had done this study with um, some fundamentalist Christians and, and um, a set of devoted atheists. And we did an fMRI study looking at, at what belief, what the nature of belief was, was in the brain. So that thread was there back in, in 2008. Um, and um, I, th that was, you know, how we believe what we believe has always been an interest of mine. And it's related to um, the concept of self, you know, who we are. A lot of the beliefs that we have that are most important to us are part of what forms our, our identity. 
and our identity and our self is, is the core of our consciousness. You know, this, this is a huge aspect of, of being conscious is having a sense of self. And that, I think that's why that, that always tied to my, my core interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was thinking about that uh, earlier religious paper while reading this one. And it had me wondering how much of it has to do with the actual topic at hand. So whether that's religion or political belief and how much of it is specifically you know, how, how strongly you self-identify with this core issue. Like you, for example, if we were challenging your beliefs that had to do with neuroscience, do you think you would more strongly or more emotionally respond to that compared to some other like physics? Right. I know. Well, um, I, I agree with where you're going. Maybe not the example. Um, mm -hmm. I do think it is identity that matters. So if, if there's a belief that is um, part of your sense of who you are um, and there's something you believe about, about the world that you think defines you and makes you who you are, um, then challenging those beliefs is going to lead to a very specific reaction in the brain and, and a lot of defensiveness and, and all the things that we found in that 2010 paper that you're, that you're referencing. A lot of times those, um, that aspect of identity um, is really a social identity, you know, um, not just who you think you are, but who you think your friends think you are and your, your uh, relationships with people. Um, beliefs are part of what binds us together. I mean, we share beliefs with our friends and, and with our family. And we, if we believe different things, if we think we have really important beliefs that are different from someone else, then we tend not to have relations, very strong relationships with that other person. Um, so, um, I think those beliefs that form our social identities are the most difficult to change. And, and a lot of times in order to change one of those beliefs, you would have to change all of your relationships. You know, like if you are, we had a lot of the, the people in our studies say that, you know, their friends think of them as a liberal person. These are people with strong liberal political beliefs. And if they were to just suddenly come out as a conservative, I mean, the friends are not going to want to hang out with them anymore. So changing a belief often involves changing your life in, in very significant ways. And isn't a matter of just analyzing facts. Now, for me, a belief about neuroscience, I don't think is, I don't think I try not to define myself um, based on any particular um, falsifiable claim about, about the world. I'm very careful about what I let into my inner circle of selfhood. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we all should be because one, once we define ourselves in particular ways, there, there are consequences to that. Um, and, and we become, harder, harder to change and less flexible. Right. Do you think that's an automatic process as in it's, it's, it's more of a, you're a creature of habit, let's say, or do you think it's, it's genuinely, you are the one who identifies with certain things and then you are the one who, let's say, uh, puts up those barriers. Yeah. So to what, to what extent is it volitional? Um, that's a really interesting question. I think a lot of it is, um, in that in-between space between volitional, volitional and, and automatic. I think there's some automatic things that happen very quickly. So let's say um, someone challenges something that you uh, believe in. Um, there, are, there are feelings that are associated with that. You know, initially you, you, you have a, a, a visceral reaction to, um, to certain challenges, to certain pieces of information. And uh, it can feel very bad to, to hear evidence against something that you believe very strongly, uh, for example. Um, and that's the automatic part. Um, but then there are, uh, you know, what happens next is, is the question. What do you, what do you do when you, when you feel that uh, negativity? I think most people do. Um, and the evidence shows that what most people do is to try to reduce those negative feelings by getting away from the source of them um, by, are uh, counter arguing by um, deriding the source of the information, all the, all the different defenses that we have um, against, uh, against those feelings come, come into play. But I don't think that means that um, there's nothing you can do volitionally. I mean, there are various points in that process where with the right amount of self-awareness, you can recognize what's happening and you can sort of break the, break the whole chain of, of the way that it works. Yeah. That, that brings up a really big topic that I didn't, intend to talk about today, but I'd love to get a neuroscientist's opinion on it. So that's free will. What's that? <laughs> yeah, what's that? Um, I don't know. I, 
hear, hear, hearing that both your your technical scientific expertise and then also your interest in these philosophical ideas, I'd I'd be interested in your opinion on it. Yeah, well, um, I I think there are certain aspects of the uh, issue that to me are, are incontrovertible. Um, I, I think we live in a more or less determinist, deterministic universe. Um, we are part of the chain of cause and effect. Our minds are not separate from uh, the causal web of, of the universe, and, and therefore they're subject to all of the um, things that come with that, uh, that you know, one thing leads to another. And even if there's some probabilisticness built in there due to quantum effects, it's not something that we have control over. Um, so there's a, there's a sense in which, um, yes, on a very basic level, there's, there's no such thing of, as free will as uh, many people conceive of it. Uh, on the other hand, there are big differences between uh, certain kinds of actions and behaviors and other kinds of actions and behaviors. For example, reflexes are very different from um, deliberative choices, um, which are very different from, you know, uh, Having, having a seizure and having your arm move because of the random activity in your um, cerebral cortex is different in important ways from planning out a movement according to a current goal that you have and executing it. Um, so I think those differences are real and they're important, they, but they exist within a deterministic universe. They, they exist within this chain of cause, cause and effect. So from a sort of like pure sense, I don't think there's any free will makes any sense. On the other hand, from a sort of describing what things are happening sense, a, a casual linguistic sense that the distinctions can be, can be useful. Um, there's also some interesting things that we know from neuroscience about what makes us feel like we have free will. So that's a separate issue of whether, you know, whether there actually is free will is one thing, but then why and how we feel like we have free will is, is a question that's squarely within the da- domain of neuroscience. And, and we have some, a little bit of insight into that now, I think from yeah, no, I, de- I definitely want to return to that. I mean, it seems like we're heading into deep waters here. So this is the last thing I want to say about. I like deep study. waters. And then, <laughs> yeah, and then we'll go um, for a philosophical swim. <laughs> so <laughs> I was I was just thinking that your um, confidence that we live in this deterministic physical universe seems like one of those core beliefs we were talking about earlier and that you're looking at in these set of studies. But then mm-hmm. I was also thinking if... I showed you some challenges to those beliefs. So like I could, you know, read off Bible verses or whatever, you'd probably just brush them off and think like it wouldn't, it, you probably wouldn't have that emotional response at all. Cause you would just dismiss these so-called challenges. And that seems very related to that. You found that the, the neural activation was directly related to how um, credible participants rated the challenges were. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Credibility has a big, big um, impact there. Um, yes, if you read Bible verses off to me, um, they wouldn't make a dent um, because I would just automatically consider them as coming from a non-credible source. On the other hand, if you told me that um, you know CERN had some new physics data that showed that you know every once in a while the the causal chain of effect in the universe is just completely broken when things start anew, <laughs> uh, and this happens within conscious minds under certain uh, regularized principles that, that allow them to, to create their own causal uh, effects that are independent of what came before them, um, then I would listen, then I'd be interested. And I, I don't know if I would be uh, upset by that. I think that would be pretty cool, but, but incredibly surprising. Yeah, probably not upset. I, it, it also makes me wonder if, if the personality trait openness has anything to do with that, like whether you perceive this new uh, world changing information as threatening or not. Yeah, I, I absolutely think that it does. And there is some evidence that it does. Um, and, you know, that's a, it, it's a, a difficult challenge because if, you know, one of your goals, one of, one of my goals is to, um, you know, part of the reason this is topic is interesting to me is because I think we'd all benefit from being more open-minded and being more open to evidence. And so um, the question comes up quite a bit. And a lot of our research now is focused on the question of how can we make people more flexible? What can we, or what can we do to communicate better with, with people when they are inflexible? Um, and 
the if if personality turns out to be one of the big determinants, that's a little bit discouraging because personality is something that's very difficult to change, right? Yeah, so that's a good tie-in back to why do we have this belief that we do have free will, whether or not we do? Because it seems like, you know, just as you're saying, we should encourage people to be more open-minded. If it's a personality trait, which might be largely heritable, and on top of that, even if there's like room for environmental sway, if the environment is determined and I don't know, what, what can you do about that? Well, first of all, we can change the environment. I mean, what, what, I think that's one of the things we have to do is we, we have created an environment that makes this a lot worse. And it's one of the things that social media does where we are, um, are arranging our systems of information sharing to um, magnify these effects where you know, we share information with each other when it corroborates our, our current beliefs. And that makes us feel closer to those people in that circle. And it's kind of a, a vicious cycle that creates these little echo chambers um, and makes it really difficult for us to even encounter information that, that challenges our beliefs. I and mean, most of us don't even, um, you know, I, I was having this conversation with my friends recently about the way uh, Trump supporters uh, felt about something. And I just don't actually encounter any Trump supporters in most of my my daily life, you know, because my social circle is, is set up to insulate me from that. So um, we, we, we can do things to actually change the environment. I think that's one of the things that we need to do is to change um, the way these electronic systems work. And we need to make an effort to maybe regulate them in some way um, to try to get ourselves out of the sort of worst case scenario here. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering from an evolutionary uh, perspective, and I don't know if you have any expertise in this. First of all, why would we be selected to not be incredibly open-minded to new ideas, given that new ideas can have, you know, survival utility, especially if, if you have these, some beliefs that are harming you. And, and especially if it's, you know, it can create conflict, even if let's say you're the one Trump supporter in your family and it makes them all hate you. Like that doesn't seem like a good trait to have evolved to be close-minded in that way. And then the second question would be, why evolve if you feel that you have free will? Oh, wow. The second one is really interesting. Well, they both are. Um, as for the first one, I mean, it, I think these evolutionary arguments are speculative, but I still enjoy doing them. Um, just That's just the caveat. Um, disclaimer. Um, I think that there are advantages to having a cohesive shared model of reality with your close group, especially in some sort of tribal situation. If we all believe the same thing about the world and we all um, hold the same sort of model in our heads, then we can act more cooperatively. So I think there's, 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 there's some built-in evolutionary advantage to uh, sharing a stable conception of the world. There's some, some stability there that's, that's useful. Um, if, if we were changing our idea about what was out there willy-nilly, you know, if we were um, very susceptible to changing our minds with, with new information, we might just be gullible. You know, that's, that's the other side of being stubborn is being gullible. So um, there's, there's pitfalls to both sides and there's probably some sweet spot in the middle. And I, I just feel like the, the social pressures are probably what pushed us more towards the side of cohesion and stability away from um, flexibility. Now, that makes a lot of sense. Why do we evolve to feel like we have free will? So first question is, do we feel like we have free will? And that sounds like an uncontroversial question, but, but it isn't. I mean, there's some people like, like, like Sam Harris who has argued recently that people don't actually feel free will. <laughs> that if you actually spend the time to introspect, there's no specific feeling of it really. I mean, I think people do distinguish between, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the mechanism. So one of the things that, that seems to be important for the, for the experience of, of free will is a pre predictability. If uh, something is, is predicted by the brain, that is, the brain knows that it's going to happen just before it does. And the brain does a lot of prediction. Some people think that the brain, it really all the brain does can be explained in terms of, of prediction, prediction. The brain is constantly predicting, for example, when I make a movement, uh, where my arm and my muscles and uh, everything is going to end up after I make that movement and what, what this, how the sensory information coming back in is going to, is going to appear. And it makes those predictions. And when something doesn't conform with the prediction, there's surprise. Um, there's, a, there's an adjustment that that's made, but 
that that prediction, that predictive process allows the brain to have have a, an idea of what's going to happen just before it does. And when we know what's going to happen, uh, the brain concludes that we caused it a, a lot of the time. So if my arm moves in a way that was unexpected, if there's sensory information coming in that I didn't predict was going to happen, maybe it's because you moved it and not because I moved it. I, if I move it, I know it's going to happen just before it does. So, so surprise is a big, big aspect of this. And, you know, you can demonstrate this really easily in the motor system. You can see how the sensory effects of our own movements are attenuated when they're, when they're predicted. We almost don't experience them at all. That's why you can't tickle yourself. If somebody else moves your hand, or if you enter some uh, unpredictability in this, if you, you add some unpredictability in the system, it feels like someone else is doing it. It's coming from the outside. I once talked with um, a group of people. I was very interested in this um, a while back, and I uh, spent some time talking to people who uh, perform with dousing rods. You know what dousing rods are? They're like these little devices that they use to divine the location of water sources. It's basically like a big superstition, but there's this whole community around it. And they hold these rods in their hand. It's like a bent rod. Um, and the rods swing back and forth uh, as you walk around and they point you towards the source of the water. There's like, you know, they believe that there are energies that are guiding these things. And they have this experience of uh, the, the rods moving on their own. That's not me moving it. There's some force, there's some energy that's, that's moving the thing. And re really the reason they experience that is because the way the rod is set up, there's like a sleeve that holds the rod and the rod um, is in it. And the movement of the rod is, is so um, chaotic that it's very difficult to predict what the movement is going to be based on the movement of your own hands. So it moves in these very unpredictable, surprising ways that make it feel like there's some kind of outside source there. It's the same thing that happens with like a Ouija board. You, know, you, you can't predict where it's going to go because the movement is the sum of everybody's movements who's touching the Ouija board. And so everyone feels that the Ouija board is kind of moving on its own. So this predictability, I mean, I think this, this, um, this feeling might sort of be a, just a, a byproduct of the way the brain is organized to um, perform things and, and to predict them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I was, I was thinking about playing the piano earlier when you were giving the example of predicted movements. And it certainly seems like that's what happens. You play, you're playing fine. You don't notice it's at a very high pace, but you make a mistake. And then it's like, you're already on the next section. And then you kind of have to adjust back and surprise, just like you mentioned, it's a surprise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Me making a mistake. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you know, it's also can happen. So that's a feeling you can have with your movements, but it, it can also happen with your own thoughts. And this is what happens in schizophrenia when, um, you know, it, one of the theories of the delusions that, that happen in, in hallucinations that happen in uh, psychosis um, is that there's some disruption of this predictive process. If your brain is constantly generating inner speech and you know what that speech is slightly before it happens, at least the brain does, then it feels that it originates with you. But if something goes wrong with that prediction and you're experiencing all this inner speech and it's unpredicted, then maybe it feels like it's coming from an outside source. And that's how you have an auditory hallucination. Right. So it's your same inner monologue, but you just feel like there are other voices. Yeah. Although why would you have, I mean, in some cases people report hearing multiple different voices. And then in other cases they, they can be like, you know, encouraging you to do negative things. And neither of those seem the case for your normal inner monologue, at least hopefully not. <laughs> Well, no, I think we do actually all experience those voice voices, you know, voices and quote and scare quotes. Um, you, you do hear, um, you do have thoughts that occur to you that you sort of dismiss or, or don't engage with if you're psychologically healthy. But but even when you are, I think those thoughts come um, that are just random negative thoughts. Like I should jump off this bridge or whatever it is. Yeah, you're stuck in traffic and yeah. or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's something about normally being able to dismiss it completely. But if that goes awry, then you take it more seriously. Yeah, yeah, because the, the thing that happens with unpredicted um, events in the mind is that they gain salience, right? And that's, part, that's partly with the tickling example, that those sensory um, effects of somebody else uh, touching you are, are very salient to you um, because, because they're not predicted. So when we, when we predict things, we, we, don't, we can safely ignore them. Uh, but when things are unpredicted, they capture our attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that answered a question, I guess, I never knew I had. <laughs> Why can't you tickle yourself? Right. So the idea then is that 
because we discount what's predicted, we either discount it or we assume that we are what causes our own actions so long as they're predicted actions. And then that can kind of build and give this illusion that we are doing all of these things we set out to do. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. But it, but it is an, it is an illusion, as you said it. It's a, it's the conclusion that the, that the brain is it's a conclusion of, of cause that the, that the brain is um, making and it doesn't really follow the causal chain back very far, right? Um, even if I predict that I'm going to move my arm and my arm moves, why did I make that prediction or how did that decision uh, come about relies on earlier um, events of, of which I can't be conscious or, or aware of, but are, are still uh, causative. So it, it is an illusion. Mm -hmm. So are you a believer in Libet's experiments? Not, not a believer, but like there, there are some, there's one camp that took those experiments showing that um, you can monitor brain activity of a movement before someone consciously reports choosing to move. Some people said, you know, that's proof. There's no free will. Others might say something like you decide to do things by your own volition before you actually notice you do. Yeah, right. And in some way, it's kind of orthogonal to the whole question, because yes, of course, there are previous causes to any particular movement. And the question is, do you have some kind of special ownership or role in causing those previous causes? But it's sort of, you know, it's just an incoherent um, concept to say that you cause them when you have to then define what the you is that, that caused them. And there's always some earlier psychological process over which you have no control or which just couldn't have gone any other way, given the whole causal chain of the universe. So I think the Libet experiments are informative in showing the particular uh, precursors to, to our choices and how they do precede uh, consciousness. But I, mm -hmm. I think that sort of had to be the case. Right. Okay. So there's, there's one more thing I want to talk to you about and that's panpsychism. Have you heard of that before? Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so I guess the general idea is consciousness exists. That's claim number one, I guess it could be debated, but if it exists and if it exists in not only us, but other animals, how far down the chain does that go? Like, you know, if we are conscious and most mammals or all mammals are probably conscious, what about like some baby little tadpole or what about some even smaller, more primitive form of life? And where, where does the questioning end? It's, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, first of all, you know, many people believe that uh, consciousness is the one thing that has to exist. I mean, this is the sort of Descartes insight. I, I, you know, because I'm having thoughts about whether or not consciousness exists, <laughs> there's, it must exist. Um, how far down does it does it go? Is a really interesting question. And let me first just bracket the problem by saying, you know, tr true panpsychism would say that it, it goes all the way down to include non-biological forms. You know, like rocks and uh, molecules, maybe. And I. Um, don't think that any useful concept of consciousness includes those things. Um, I just think it loses all of its meanings. And we really do take it to refer to um, some state where it is like something to, to have an experience. And it, it just doesn't, just doesn't seem to be able to apply to those really simple circumstances. I think we can start to answer this question if we start to understand the origins of consciousness in life. And we trace back um, how consciousness came, came, about, came about in evolution. And in this, uh, I, I am heavily inf influenced by Antonio Damasio, who's written qu quite a bit about it recently, and uh, believes that you know, consciousness is born of the processes of, of life regulation and our monitoring of those, our, our biological systems, trying to keep track of what's happening inside our bodies and building maps, specifically maps of what's happening inside the body. And uh, those maps give rise to these feelings that, that are um, basically conscious 
projections of the internal states of the body or our very, our very first feelings, uh, which are then elaborated in, in later creatures. Um, so according to that view, if you, if you have some kind of a, a map of the internal state of your body, you have the potential for consciousness. And if you don't, if you have something really simple like a paramecium, um, it, what, you're, what you're dealing with is not gonna be consciousness. Yeah, so I guess you're still left with the question of exactly when do you go from the, the sort of jump from not conscious to conscious? It seems like you're, you're suggesting it comes at some form of complexity. So it's not like a fundamental property of, of all life or all matter, as a panpsychist would say. That's right. But I do think it's, it's not a, um, a, a binary. It's a, it's a gradation. I mean, it can exist in very rudimentary proto forms and then become more and more like what we think consciousness is as as you get closer and closer to us yeah i agree with the gradation idea for sure i've been toying around with the panpsychist idea because it seems to me like you're, you're left with two options you're either going to say well you're either going to be a panpsychist and just say that everything has this whatever fundamental property is related to consciousness but then it only reaches a certain level of complexity at some point and we'd only recognize it at some point, but the building blocks are there. So that would be the proto-consciousness is fundamental idea. And then there's the other idea, which is this, that it emerges at some later point, but that would kind of mean that whatever that point is, is kind of arbitrarily defined by us to fit a certain definition. So it, it might not be consciousness in its pure sense if you think about what does it mean to have subjective experience. I think it's possible for there to be natural phenomenon that, that, that arise when certain conditions are met. I think this is one of those cases. And I don't think it's clear what the conditions have to be yet. I think there's a lot of room for argument there. So I outlined a, a, a sketch of maybe something to do with um, a functional properties of a system that's monitoring itself. Um, but there are other stabs at this. I mean, there's the, the you know, I'm not a huge fan of the information integration theory of Giulio Tononi, but that, that's um, one attempt to define what kind of behaviors the system has to have in order to um, exhibit consciousness that has to do with, in, in, in that view, information integration. So it could be something like that. I mean, any of these things that, um, that uh, emerge in phenomena that arise when, when um, matter arranges itself into, into certain patterns of behavior, I think that's conceivable. Yeah. All right, that went pretty off topic, but I'm glad to have. No, that was right on topic. That was the core of the whole topic from, to begin with, because we were saying that was this is the one thing that's always interested me and why I uh, do any of this. Yeah, definitely. So that that would be a good place to close then, just to to articulate more fully what your your motivation is and what your fu what you'd like to do in future work, what you'd like people to take home from your work in general. Yeah, I do uh, still try to be um, motivated by curiosity as, as much as I can and to stay in touch with that and to try to um, fend off all of the other uh, interests, all the other motivations that try to pull uh, one away from that. Um, and there are many of them. Um, and so, you know, what I happen to be curious about at the moment, I, I just think the, um, the way that we process uh, beliefs and, and information um, is just so important to us right now in understanding um, how we can uh, be flexible in our beliefs and also just understanding how beliefs spread and form in, in groups and how things like conspiracy theories arise. We, we, we need to have consistent, accurate models of the world. I and mean, I think we're seeing right now in this case with the pandemic and, and vaccination, how what people believe about the world really matters so much. And if people believe if misinformation spreads, it can affect our actual livelihoods. I mean, uh, we, if we um, look right now at, at um, hesitation about va vaccines and the kinds of misinformation that are out there, it's just a, a great example to me of, of understanding the psychological processes behind how we believe what we believe just seems to be the most important thing. Um, but who knows, I could be captured by something else in five years. I have no idea. That's the fun part of science. Right. Dr. Kaplan, thank you. This was great. Thank you, Adam. Great.